Whenever mega theropods are brought up, one thing that's sure to follow is intense debates on size, which was the biggest. Even on my mother's channel, whenever T-Rex, Spinosaurus, or the large Carcharodontosaurids are discussed, there's plenty of heat and, sadly, even vitriol. The problem is that many of these potential dethroners have been fragmentary, and given the paucity of material, only estimation methods can be used to derive possible sizes. So nothing definitive can be declared size-wise, and claims made from extrapolating from small fragments are premature, irrationally optimistic, or downright ridiculous. One needs only look at some of the wild numbers made for the Goliath T-Rex to see this. It's also a common argument that, since we have so few fossils, what are the chances that we happen to have found the biggest of its kind? So let's add some percentage to the upper end, say 5-10%. to Various size estimation methods have been proposed, and already described by various channels, and I'll link to some of these videos below for more detail. For now, I'd like to share some highlights from an interesting paper by Henderson 2023, in which he discusses how certain biological constraints can set a hard ceiling to theropod body size. Now, the challenge that theropods have that sauropods don't is that they have only two legs with which to walk, run, turn, all while maintaining balance. The key muscles involved are the pelvic muscles and the caudo femoralis longus in the tail. Now, these muscles grow according to fixed allometric rules. Henderson's idea is simply this. As theropods grew, their body weights would have ballooned faster than their muscles' ability to keep up. At some point, they'd simply be too big to move effectively. So Henderson studied two key areas. First, the lateral area of the pelvis. He assumed that this area would be optimized to provide enough space for muscle origins of sufficient size. Second, the cross-sectional area of the tail base, measured immediately posterior to the pelvis. This is the site of origin for the caudo femoralis longus, which drives the forward motion of the theropod body. A force potential scales with muscle cross-sectional area, or CSA. A larger muscle with a larger CSA should be able to generate more force. Conversely, higher requirements for force generation would need larger muscles. Henderson therefore considers these two measures as indicators of available force for acceleration and stability. Henderson modeled 14 theropods from the tiny 80 cm long Comsognathus and the 12 m T-Rex. Digital 3D reconstructions accounted for body volume, lung space, and air sacs. Mass estimates were validated using modern reptiles, birds, and mammals. Key species included Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Carnotaurus, Gorgosaurus, Acrocanthosaurus, Despetosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus rex. He also compared these to fragmentary giants such as Spinosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and of course, Giganothosaurus. Now you see here six of the 14 theropods on which Henderson ran his calculation of lateral pelvic areas, as well as the position of the transverse sections used to calculate the tail based CSAs. And here are the highlights. Now, plotting body length against body mass we find an allometric relationship with a gradient of 3.55, so both are tightly correlated. No surprises there. As body length increases, the lateral pelvic areas increase, as does the caudal transverse area. But notice that while highly correlated with body length, the gradients are shallower, about 2.4, this means that as body length increases, available muscle force lags behind increases in body mass. As the dinosaur got longer, their muscles weren't keeping up in lockstep. When dividing both measures by muscle mass, we find that the pelvic area to total mass ratio falls. So too falls the transverse tail area to total mass ratio. Now here, this line is body length against body mass. 
Now this line is where it gets interesting. Now, this line plots the acceleration potential as a function of body length, where the white diamonds are the side-to-side -side direction and the black diamonds are the forward direction. So with increasing size, acceleration capability fell, with the bigger species having less than 10% of the acceleration of the smallest. So Compsognathus could dart quickly after fast lizards, while T-Rex could do perhaps a fast lumber, but not a sprint. Now next, I want to talk about rotational inertia a bit. I'm going to grossly simplify it, so if my math is wrong, just let me know when I'll post corrections in the description ASAP. We're all familiar with plain old inertia. An object at rest resists a change in motion. Rotational inertia, or RI, is the same idea, but applied to turning or spinning. Henderson found that the elongate pteropod body has a high RI about this vertical axis here. Now, this applies torques to the body about the support leg, like this, which will have to be controlled by a combination of pelvic and tail muscles of sufficient size. I'll skip over variables like head or tail orientation and body mass, and say that in short, Henderson finds that the RI scales with body length to the power of 5.5, so it doesn't scale linearly. If the body length doubles, RI doesn't just double, it goes up 45 times. If we take 12 meters as a baseline estimate for Giganotosaurus, and then go up to 13 meters, and then 14 meters, here's how it looks. For 12 meters to 13 meters is an increase in 55%, and from 12 to 14 meters, it's about 133%. I hope my math is correct, but the key takeaway is that linear increases in body length lead to exponential increases in RI, which then requires exponential increases in muscle-generated torques. This obviously isn't possible, suggesting that the ability to turn quickly and hence the agility plummets with increasing size. According to Henderson, the estimated acceleration capability levels off above a body length of about 10 meters. This graph shows acceleration in the lateral and forward motions only, but the body length increase greater than about 12 meters will result in even worse increases in the RI. He notes at the time of the paper, no complete fossil shows a theropod of more than around 12 meters long. Indeed, most respectable reconstructions also suggest that the Scotty T-Rex was in the vicinity as well. I'd have been interested to see how T-Rex Goliath would scale if only we had the pelvis. He postulates that beyond this point, forward acceleration, such as chasing prey, and lateral acceleration, keeping the balance, would fall below survival thresholds. The theropod would be too slow to adjust its speed, too clumsy to stay upright, and any giant that grew beyond this biomechanical ceiling would have been weeded out by natural selection. Rotational inertia compounds the problem, making sharp turns virtually impossible. So what about Giganotosaurus? Because of the close relationship between pelvic lateral area and body length, for incomplete skeletons, we can still predict body size as long as we have well-preserved pelvis. This is in fact the case with Cacarodontosaurids such as Merexis, and happily for us, Giganotosaurus. So Merexis he estimates at 10.2 to 11.6 meters, while for Giganotosaurus, he calculates 11.6 to 13.4 meters, with a central estimate of 12.5 meters, or 41 feet. Interestingly, this matches the original description by Correa and Salgado in 1995. So while it was indeed one of the largest land predators ever, it still fits within the 12 meter mark, but may have maxed out the natural limits for theropods. If Henderson's work proves correct, then Giganotosaurus is still impressive, simply for having gotten as big as a bipedal predator could possibly get. There are of course other methods, and if you favour another with different size estimates, please comment below along with the reference. Now let's do the comparisons. Of course, we'll compare them to each other. Now here in the head, you can see the high quality detail. 
And I've noted in other videos that the choice of colour can impact how easily detail is seen. Would really have been great to have a better seal, but again, the green seals better for me. The mouth open, and here to show you how the detail shows up with either colour. So we can do a comparison and maybe help you make a decision. Who knows, your decision might just be to get the blue. Now each really is nicely painted and wonderfully don't feel derivative. Now here's a view from the top. I feel if I had a choice to choose one though, it would likely be the plain one. What a nice pair these make, almost like regional versions of the same animal. Now the next most obvious comparison calls for the PNSO Lucas, the Giganotosaurus. And comparing the two, the Haolongku is longer and also beefier. The PNSO appears more elongate, even comparing the leg forward sides. I need not say it's also beautifully painted. A close-up comparison of the heads for you. You can see the more angular chin of the PNSO in the lateral view. I'll just show you both variants. And here's how they look with the mouths open. And from the top, and here I think the Haolongku is texturally more interesting for sure. The scale aesthetics are of course different. You see here that reticulated pattern, which by the way also dresses part of the tie. But whoa, PNSO really was ahead of its time, and a paint application still pleases, with streaks that look so subcutaneous. From here, you see the length difference more clearly, but also the thickness of the Haolongku, especially at the tail base. The PNSO in retrospect looks like it could use a beefier tail, so somewhere in between would be my personal preference. Next is the oft-forgotten Eofauna Giganotosaurus. I was always disappointed with the hands, but it's still a nice model, and has nice conservative colours. Of course, in terms of details, there's no contest. It's actually comparable in length to today's Giganotosaurus. And I can't help but bring out this beautiful wild safari Giganotosaurus, which I consider the spiritual successor to the Carnegie Museum line. I absolutely love this striped pattern, despite being simply applied by today's standards, and of course some inaccuracies. But this model really stood out for me when I was so young to collecting that it has a special place in my heart. And finally, some other Kakarodontosaurids. Let's look at the Haolongku GR Toys collab Kakarodontosaurus, the model that for many people really put Haolongku on the radar. You see already the promise of a superlative paint application which has continued in a toned-down form for their regular models today.
Here's the PNSO Cacarodontosaurus. Such soothing and calming colours. We have Acrocanthosaurus, one of my absolute favourite paint applications, while still using earth tones. We have to include, of course, the PNSO Miraxis. PNSO really made the effort to give the Cacarodontosaurids beautiful paint apps. And finally, the PNSO Mapusaurus. Last, of course, is our standard size comparators, PNSO Wilson T-Rex and Cameron T-Rex. So that's it for the new Haolongku Giganotosaurus. All in all, a worthy offering from Haolongku for one of the most popular theropods. I wish the colour was rendered more like the paint masters, but still, they're very nice to look at. Anatomically, of course, nothing definitive can be said, though I would have liked a more prominent chin. The pre-lacrimal length, some of you have informed me, is based on Dan Fox's reconstruction, so if you like that one, this really is quite close. I've also added a link to PaleoNerd01's explanation for his longer skull reconstruction, which was made after we knew of Meraxis. But really, these are minutiae. And if you're looking for one of the best-looking Giganotosaurus out there right now, this one is it. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.